Are you ready to manage your work and personal world better to live a fulfilling, productive life? Then you've come to the right place. Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things productivity. Here are your hosts, Ray Sidney Smith and Augusto Pinaud with Francis Wade and Art Gelwix. Welcome back, everybody, to Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things productivity. I'm Ray Sidney Smith, and I'm joined here with Augusto Pinaud, Francis Wade, Art Gelwix. Today, so much of our lives are lived in the ever-flowing river of data that we produce, consume, and discard. But what if you lose that data? What if your data gets compromised by some bad actor on the internet? It happens. Do you have a plan in place to back up that data? And that's the topic of today's cast. Francis originally generated this topic idea, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Francis, to talk a little bit about the background that led you to come up with this topic in the first place. Well, let let me go back in time a little bit. When I started leading time management programs about 10 years ago, one of the skills I defined was something called storing. And it was really all about paper. And what happened over time is that it's, of course, changed because who uses paper anymore, right? Most of us are using digital information. And the challenge is that many people have not made that transition from storing stuff on paper to storing stuff digitally. So they don't have the skills of having great backups. So what I mean by great backup is when a disaster occurs, you are completely protected. So a tsunami or a hurricane hits and there goes your laptop and uh, and your phone and and all of your diskettes and hard drive, external hard drives. And what do you have to store your contacts, your appointments, all the critical information that you needed, all your passwords? Where is all that information and how can you keep it stored on a regular basis so that you're completely protected no matter what happens? And recently I, I, I had, a, of course, a catastrophe. I, I, I learned the hard way that my, my system that I thought was perfect had a flaw because it was not backing up a particular kind of file, which was, it, you know, the provider didn't tell me this information. I found it out after the fact, lost a couple of days work complained, but I realized that I didn't have a great system in place, not as great as I thought I did. In particular, what bothered me was that things like pictures of my uh, great, great, great grandparents. So I have some pictures like that. I have the, the paper picture and I have the digital picture, but I still haven't solved the problem of where you store either kind of picture. Where do I store a long-term legacy file so that I can you know, one day show it to, I don't have great grandkids, but if I had great grandkids, if I, if I were going to have them, well, how would I show it? How would I keep it for them? How do I keep legacy files so that they last forever? Where, what's the safe place? It's obviously not my hard drive or my smartphone, but where is it? So that's what sort of got the, the thought going. Thanks for the background. That's great. So I wanted to start us off with discussing perhaps the importance of having backups Francis, you point out several of them, primarily the the idea of a catastrophe that destroys a computer or all of your computers. Uh, I heard a couple of uh, weeks ago, a house exploded, probably from propane or whatever the gas was that was being used in the house filled up and the house literally exploded and killed the two the two residents. And that's just insane to think that that can happen in today's day and age. But it does. Hurricanes happen. A colleague of mine had all of his business's computer servers swallowed up by an earthquake. And so we all experience catastrophe on on occasion. My office had a building fire actually quite recently to to name a few, you know, catastrophes that that have happened to, you know, in, in my own world. And without those backups, really, that would have been potentially the end of the business because so much of, of what a business is, is its data. And so do, do any of you have any thoughts in terms of the, um, any thoughts that you wanted to share with listeners about the importance of, of backup data? And then we can kind of go into how we each set up our systems or would, would ideally set up a system. I have one word for all this, and the word is redundance. I mean, it doesn't matter where they are, but you cannot trust on a one place. So you need to have redundance of those backups, especially the more important the content is, the more redundance you need. 
in my particular case, I have a service called Code 42. It's a company who make it, and the, the software is called Crash Plan, and then that goes to their server. And in, aside of that, I also have Dropbox for all the other files, and I also have Evernote. So, and they tend to be triplicated. So if one of the three servers fail or two of the three servers fail, I will still be okay. Uh, I also have a local hard drive at home that do back up. So I'm not going to say it's completely fail-proof. I'm sure there is ways that all that ca- can be contained in a massive catastrophe that will make that I lose all of that. But in general, I think there is a, I have a less chance of this happening to me. I run a similar process of OneNote, uh, OneDrive, Google Drive, local hard drive, lots of drives. The redundancy that Augusto just mentioned is critical to this. If you don't have a way to have things in multiple places, because we all know bad things happen, even beyond just bad things, though, data corruptions, uh, synchronization errors, there's a lot of reasons why your information can get out of sync. I count on those multiple systems. But if it's something's really critical, uh, I'll put it onto a flash drive and throw that flash drive into a firebox. Uh, things like tax return information, scans of critical documents, all of those are on a flash drive that's in a um, firebox right now. So I've got stuff every place, which creates its own issues. But I should be able to recover whatever I need. Yeah, there certainly is something to say for understanding the various types of ways data can be destroyed. For example, Art is talking about uh, fire damage. Obviously, there's an opportunity for water damage. If there's flooding, there's opportunity for if you are using digital data. uh, Most data is written through uh, magnetic means, meaning that it's imprinted through uh, putting ones and zeros in magnetic code on on these on these. you know, drive sometimes. Uh, And so the goal for you is to figure out and make sure that uh, the data is stored in a place that is is not going to demagnetize or have a strong magnetic field that's going to destroy the data. So you have to really think about these things. Um, high pressure environments, right? You can't put, uh, you know, if you if you decide to to back up to say DVDs and you and you write your data to a DVD uh, and stick that in an environment that has high pressure uh, and a little bit of heat, and guess what? That DVD is going to warp, and that will be the end of that. So long term storage needs to be thought about. You know, it needs to be in, in a climate controlled environment. Uh, you know, preferably off the floor and uh and fireproof so so yeah if you're going to do physical data storage that's that's important i personally believe in thorough backups of all of your data but you have to start defining what you know quote unquote all your data means and whether you're keeping the data you need or are in control of it all many times you don't actually hold your data like your your gmail email if you use that as a repository for information do you really have control over that? And so that means maybe you need to use Google Checkout, which is a, uh, an application Google gives you in order to be able to download your Gmail uh, data and save that as a, as a JSON file, as a database file, so that you can then back it up. But out there is all kinds of data that you may or may not have control over. And I think it's really important for you to recognize and, and take note of those things. I have a little checklist of all the things that need to be backed up. And I go out there and make sure that I have access to those things. I also feel like a lot of people hoard data. And hoarding data is very similar, in my mind, to hoarding in real life. Whether it's psychic, digital, or physical clutter, you are likely hoarding some kind of data. And you need to figure out what that is and why it is. We want to make sure that we um, identify whether we're hoarding some kinds of digital data and and decide how we want to deal with it. Obviously, you know, keeping data, saving data in backups or otherwise, storage spaces is cheaper today than it ever was. But from a productivity perspective, 
it can it can actually dampen things because that's more data that needs to be indexed. So that means it takes more time to find everything and more things that you need to sift through if you don't have an effective search tool. So just be very aware. Google is just as much a culprit for this. If you look at their model for Gmail, they don't want you to delete stuff. They want you to archive it and then go back and search and find it. They're encouraging the behavior of retaining all the digital flotsam that you have. Now, granted, their desire is to sell you storage space and build up their search index, but it's just establishing the fact that digital content has no real weight. So why not keep it? I mean, what's the harm of, of keeping this stuff so you can get to it later? Because you don't need it. I mean, there's a, there's a, you know, digital detritus is a, I think is a real complex that the human mind has to deal with. And the more we have to deal with, it's not categorical stress, it's the volume of stressors, right? So I, I frequently talk about, you know, you have categorical stress, something traumatic happens, that's a, that's a stressor that creates distress. And then there is the volume of stress, good stress and bad stress, then compounds and becomes distress. In your in your in your discussion about Google, I I absolutely agree that you know Google does. It's been a long, hard fight for Google to give us a delete option, for example, in Gmail. Now we have one, but they their primary goal is to to amass data so that they can understand you better and then make that information more useful to you through search. And they've done a, a fantastic job of that. The one of the unintended consequences, though, is that people then feel like they can keep everything in digital and it's a it's a liability uh, for example we live in america you know with with the litigious society problem you know where everybody's suing each other for things well your email is a big old you know treasure trove for some lawyer someday to subpoena you for all of that all your emails it's a it's a liability as much as it is a an asset for finding things and i'm i'm not against saving all of your email. I just think that you should be aware that you probably have bits of data out there everywhere that that you need to start taking some command and control over. I'm sort of of the school of thought that if I have 10 meg of old data that I have from, they say, 2005, that back in 2005, that 10 meg was a very big deal because I only had maybe, I don't know, 200 meg of hard drive space. But today I have, I don't know how much, how many terror I have floating around in the in the cloud and wherever. So that 10 meg is is no longer uh, the concern it was because it's such a small speck compared to all the information or all the space that I have to store. So I think it, it it's not just the detritus and the fact that it exists, but it's the detritus to overall volume ratio. If I could get really fancy, if that detritus is small relative to the amount of other information I have. And if I can somehow ring fence it, if I can somehow place it somewhere where it would just stay there and I don't have to carry it around on my hard drive, I don't have to copy it, I don't have to index it, I don't have to search it. It's just there somewhere. If I could ring fence it safely and leave it there and only go there if I absolutely have to at some point, then it need not, it need not cause me any agita. I don't feel stressed. I just know that somewhere that email from 2005 is safely stored. I don't have to do anything about it. I don't have to maintain it. And if I ever need to access it, I could. But I don't have, I don't have, I don't think that capability exists today, to my knowledge. I, I, I'm, I find myself logging around files from one laptop to the next, to the next, to the next. And yes, it's backed up. What I really want to do is to offload it somewhere safe so that it can just occupy some corner of the internet and I would never go to it unless I need to have it. If this were all physical stuff that you put in a storage unit and you were paying $200, $300 a month to have this storage unit, would it be a good use of your time, energy, and resources to keep that stuff in that space? If it is, then good on you. If it's not, then it's probably a good idea to look at why you have that information, you know, you're holding on to that digital information. And the the goal, of course, is to not have to 
I mean, it's kind of like lugging emotional baggage from one relationship to another. You are, you're, 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 you've got all of this history that has positive and negative associations, and maybe it's useful. Maybe it may be useful in the future in some way, shape, or form. But in my opinion, and having looked at lots and lots of people's systems over the years, that information is usually useless and is actually holding back your productivity. You're just keeping stuff for keeping stuff's sake. And that's my only point, is that if you're keeping it for a reason, and it's not a negative, unhealthy reason, then keep it, you know, go for it. But if you're if you're just keeping it to keep it, it's likely going to cause you more you know, pain and suffering down the road when you recognize that, oh, there was maybe 1% of that data that was really important that should have been backed up. And the 99% really didn't matter. But now that the 100% has been destroyed in some catastrophe, you are out of having that 1% of data, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I, I just wanted to give folks a, a kind of a, a come of some of the things that I, I always look at, which are photos, uh, which you mentioned, Francis, videos, music, documents, and databases. Now, databases can be things like uh, OneNote, as Art mentioned, Evernote, as, as Augusta mentioned, your email, your calendar. If you have a digital calendar system, it has a database of your events. Uh, your contacts. I recently had a client have this issue where the phone uh, was... I think dropped on the street several hours later, recognizing that the phone is gone, then now a new phone is needed to be gotten. Where were the contacts? There was no backup. Supposedly there was a backup, you know, those kinds of things. So it's a, it's, it, you need to, you need to have control over those contacts, especially if you don't know uh, phone numbers today, as most people don't, you know, they they live on your phone and you don't really think about people's phone numbers. Uh, so make sure that you review each of those for how you're going to back them up, back them up across all the devices with some kind of persistent memory storage. One is that the, the, the analogy between between digital storage and physical storage, I think is is has a problem with it. Because in the digital world, I think Art mentioned this, there's not there's not that pull on your psyche that physical objects have in the physical world. Um, so I think the, 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 we have an advantage by using digital information. And part of what we can do is take advantage of the fact that it doesn't have the same pull that physical, physical information does or paper information. The second is that it takes more time. It can take more time. Or it could take me more time to go through my emails from 2005 and delete the ones I don't want than it is just to like I said, ring fence it somewhere. I don't want to spend the time to go through each of those pieces of information. I just want to lock it away somewhere, so somewhere safe, leave it there, have it not bother me, because the time it takes to go through and sort through is just too much. So in, in my life or my world, I'm creating what you call digital detritus all the time, but it's not a problem that I'm doing that. And it's too much, it takes too much time to go through it, to bother to go through it. In other words, the, the investment in time to sort it out is too great. So I prefer just to lock it up and just leave it. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes sense. It just is, it, it shows, and I, I, and it's a, I appreciate that. I, yeah, I come from a completely different kind of perspective, you know, obviously, because I'm, I want to make sure that I'm always cleaning up as I go, kind of mise en place, you know, being a, a cook or a chef. And I don't want things to stick around that don't need to stick around. And that's really quite important to me to be able to be my most effective self. And again, this goes back to our listeners. It's listening to the various perspectives here on Productivity Cast, I think is amazing because we're able to come from different places. Mentally, there's a big difference between things that need to be stored and things that need to be backed up. So you've got multiple copies of the same thing. But if we think about personal and professional productivity, one of the things you can put into your system is a recurring activity of doing the pruning of this historic tree of information. So it, you have those idle times, you know, you're sitting there waiting for an Uber or something else like that. Rather than wandering through Instagram or perusing Pinterest, 
take a few minutes to go through your OneDrive and kill off some old things and things. You could do that as a recurring rolling activity, which will make your backup process much more efficient. But also it gives you a better sense of to what's actually in your system. Amen, Brother Art. I'll I'll sign up for that church. <laughs> I'm passing the plate your way now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so so I wanted to I wanted to make the point that it's it's fine if your system is different than any of ours, or if you want to or need to kind of splice things together, kind of make a hybrid of what we're talking about here today. But the reality is is that if you feel a difficulty in finding things, it's likely because you have too many things or the, or the tools aren't good enough. And it may be that you're stuck in an environment, you know, with a set of tools where search may not be great. So, or the speed of your internet connection might, may not be great, or your hardware might not be fast enough. And if that's the case, and you're not capable of finding things fast enough, then offloading to a backup system different than, you know, Augusto said redundancy, and I, and I think I understood what he meant, but but redundancy is different than backup. And so a redundancy is, is, is a duplicate set of the file in synchronization with that, with that file. So when you delete that file, like with Dropbox, it deletes the Dropbox version. And so backup in my mind is that, which, that file which you're not using, that's a copy of, the, of the, you know, the prior files and is stored somewhere else so that if something happens to the primary file in its primary location, then you still have the file to use uh, from, from that other location, from the, from the other space that you've put it on. And that could be the same hard drive you know, in, in some short-term backups. And as you go into longer-term backups, you can then uh, offload them onto another external hard drive, onto cloud storage, or even putting them onto physical external drives and delivering them to other locations than the one you're at. Uh, because if, you're, if your home goes up in flames, uh, then you know all the data that was there, if it's all locally stored, even if it's back up, backed up to a lo local external hard drive, that's going to be destroyed as well. So, so think about those things in that way. So my dad passed away three years ago. And it happened suddenly. It was like a space of a, like a month. He was mm -hmm. sick and then he passed. But I had the duty of going through his digital content. And part of what you're backing up for always, you should be backing up for is, is what happens if you pass away? And I look at my own system and I, I doubt that my wife could figure out my patchwork of backups or, or even of just regular content. I'm, I know she knows the password to my computer very well. <laughs> so, you know, if anything were to happen, I haven't backed up for her. I backed up for me. But we really should be backing up for the next person because... Right. And I, I you know, we, start, we started off by saying that we were, we need to address the principles of backup. And we do. So we've been talking about examples, but the principles are still... But we all, one of the principles needs to be that we need to leave behind almost like a set of one, two, three, four, five instructions for someone who gets into your system and now has to decipher the whole melange of stuff that you have. Some of it's written, some of it was in your head, all of the idiosyncrasies that you've put in place. And there's no... I've never seen anyone talk... About, well, I've seen a couple of people talk about the leaving behind a roadmap to get through the, the melange that you're about to leave behind. But there's certainly no principles that I've seen. There's a tool, LastPass, that's a password archiver protector online thing that has an excellent feature that describes just what you're talking about. It's an emergency. And long story short, the way it works is... With my account, I have designated my wife's email to be one of the potential emergency people. What she can do is send a request into LastPass through their app asking for access to my password repository. What happens is I get an email notification that says, hey, she's asking for this. Should she have it or not? Now, in any normal situation, you would expect, okay, notification, confirmation, she has access. 
But if there's a case where I cannot provide that confirmation, I'm incapacitated or, or worse, I can set a time period so that when she sends that request in, if I don't act on that, giving her access by X number of days, she will automatically have access. And within that system, I've gone through and put all the critical information, not only my password stuff, but account information, uh, access to insurance policies, all of the stuff that's necessary. And it's stored in this online archive. It's a really nice feature that they've provided. And it's something that I think, even if you don't use that kind of surface, uh, creating something somewhere that the people who would need access to get into your stuff, it's really critical because Francis couldn't have hit on a better issue. You've got to prepare for everybody else who's going to deal with this legacy beyond us. We're not dealing with banker boxes anymore. We're dealing with highly encrypted data system. Not everybody's a computer geek. Yeah, I think this could be an entire episode. Uh, having been in estate planning, that industry before, back then we didn't really talk about or even think about passwords for your digital life. But today they're actually bespoke products for people to be able to pass on Facebook account access and other kinds of, of account access uh, for those things. And it doesn't have to be just you know, social network and email passwords. It's, you know, your bank accounts are online and your your credit, you know, card systems and all of those things that when a loved one passes away and you need to step in and uh, assist and, and notify people and still, you know, deal with those assets. And people don't have to pass away, by the way. Physical or mental incapacity happens all the time. And when someone is even, even short-term disabled, then you need to be able to be able to help them. And it's a it's a real problem. One one thing that I will let people know about is that Google has something called a, a trust account manager. And what this is, is a is a setting inside of your Google account, where you can tell Google to give access to your account, if you have been inactive, all told in the application for some period of time. So you can say it's you know 30 days 60 days 90 days what have you and so i've appointed my executor of my estate to have access to my account within that time frame if i'm not active and i'm active obviously in my email every day but once i go inactive because i've been injured or i've expired from this planet then he will get access to it and be able to uh, you know step in to my, into my shoes and, and deal with whatever's in there. Primarily, I mean, it's just basically to delete the email account because there's no reason for it to be around subsequent to my to my passing. So the the but while if I'm if for some reason I'm like I go into the hospital and I'm I'm there for a while, I want to make sure that my executor has you know my my representative has my uh, the ability to checking the email and dealing with other things because I probably get financial statements there. I get everything there. You know what I mean? So it's important to to have these kinds of access. But maybe we'll have a whole whole topic on that subject someday. So I, I was gonna I was gonna ask you, Francis, that after after all of this had happened, did you did you come up with a system for yourself? And and what does that system look like today? Yeah, sure. I'll 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 share that. It's it's I'm not satisfied with what I have at all. But anyway, I, the, the first group of things I thought about were was what I mentioned before, the legacy stuff, stuff that I would want to pass on to another generation or stuff that I, I'd want to keep, um, like pictures that I took in the 90s, for example, that I don't want on my hard drive necessarily because it's taking up space and I, I don't really need it, but I don't really have anywhere else to put it. So, so I've tried to put some of it on my... Um, hard drive on on GoDaddy. So I use GoDaddy as a service provider and not not hard drive, but on my server, I guess. So I've uploaded some files to, to that server and keep them, just to keep them in a sort of permanent place. That that in my mind is where I have my permanent long-term stuff. So if I did a video 10 years ago, I don't need to look at it. I don't need to have immediate access to it, but I've sort of ring-fenced it over in my GoDaddy 
sort of account, so to speak. The difficulty is, of course, that there's no easy way to upload other than through FTP, one file at a time or a few files at a time. But it, it, it still feels very spotty to me. And if, if I went looking for a legacy file like I did recently, couldn't find it from 10 years ago, and I realized that there's some holes in the system. So that's legacy stuff, stuff that's there permanently, but I don't want hanging around on my current computer at the moment. The sort of midterm stuff is stuff that's business related, but I'm not working on and it probably won't get to for maybe in the next, won't need in the next year to two years. Um, that stuff I, I back up using iDrive and I also use pCloud. Um, those are my two um, cloud service sort of backups. As these guys have said, you guys have said redundancy is the key. I also back up um, overnight using or once a week using an external hard drive. Those services also, uh, pCloud in particular, and well, I guess pCloud is the only one that saves me in the very, very short term. So if I if I lose a file immediately, pCloud is most likely to be the place where I could find it. If I'm working on it yesterday and my hard drive crashes, so that's real short term backup. So they they it wouldn't be caught by my external hard drive because that only runs once a week at the moment. Uh, iDrive may catch it depending on how frequently it does its backups. But pCloud would catch an immediate crash or an immediate corruption, something that's happened in the last half an hour, let's say. So I've tried to, I've tried to put together three strategies for sh- immediate term, midterm, and long-term or forever term. And it, again, I'm not happy with what I have. I feel like I'm just sort of feeling around in the dark rather than using any kind of principled step-by-step method, which which I would like to have because to get, to get back to the last point, I'd love to point my the executor of my state, for example, to my setup and say, okay, here's where the short-term stuff, the mid-term stuff, and the legacy stuff can be found. I'd love to pass on the schema to someone else if I were to pass away. I'd love to be able to. Yeah, so this this is a good uh, introduction into in, or, or transition into what I'm what I've done over the years, and I believe that it might be helpful in in kind of the principled way, but also in, in kind of the, the specific tools that I'm using. So I've created a, a Google Docs document, and the Google Doc is shared with my my estate representative, and the goal is to outline what things need to be commanded and controlled not this is not stuff that like is will related you know it's not assets or whatever but they're just things that need to be handled you know if i still have my dog or you know a cat or a fish you know you don't want them to die because i died at home probably working uh, <laughs> um so you 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 I, i've manifested this manual of sorts and it has all of the instructions that are necessary for being able to manage around these things. Inclusive in that is a the, is are the passwords to my major password managers and anything that's not you know necessarily important for great security. I've put in there. Everything else that's of high security is actually inside of the LastPass account. So I use LastPass like Art, and so I have all of the really important stuff inside inside there. And the password actually in the Google document is encoded, so only my personal representative would actually know how to kind of decrypt what I what I typed physically in as the password. So I didn't type the password literally. I typed a, a code that he and I know. In, in this particular case, my personal representative of my estate is my brother, my older brother. Since I trust him and we, you know, we grew up together, we we have our own little code. He knows what that password is based on our in-person discussion. So that's just one thing you can think about is manifesting a system so that people that you trust can decode it once they once they need access. But he has persistent access to that document so that if any time I am for some reason incapacitated, he can step in and help. So I have machines that are Windows, Mac, and Linux. And so I'm going to talk about the Mac and the Windows. If people have questions about Linux, feel free to email me. But the idea here is that on the Mac machine, I have Time Machine backing up to a USB drive. And there's 
nothing of consequence on my on the Mac machines. So I don't particularly care about what's backed up there, but I do it anyway, just for good measure uh, because you know stupid things happen so i have time machine backing up to usb drives for each of the each of the macbooks and then google backup and sync which is an application provided by google drive that is on each of the computers and that allows for redundancy not backup redundancy and has then gives me remote access to the files that are on the desktop through google drive so if i save something to my downloads folder on one computer and then walked out of the house or out of the office without it, I would it would be backed up to Google Drive and I would have access to it there. On the Windows side, I use something called Duplicati. And Duplicati does both the local daily backups and then a weekly that's local. So it's on the hard drive that is currently sitting on. Actually, I'm sorry, it's an ex external drive. So the Windows machines push to push to locally to an external drive using Duplicati. And I'll put links to all this stuff in the show notes. And then weekly, it then takes it, the, an entire payload of that backup of those drives and pushes them to a cloud storage service. And so I, I have it actually sent to several. Uh, so it can push, I believe, to Dropbox, Box, OneDrive, Google Drive, and so, and so forth, Amazon Cloud Drive, and so forth. And so I have it sent to several of those. And again, those are those are weekly backups so that I'm keeping several weeks of data going back. And then it deletes the oldest one. I think it's eight weeks. So, you know, every eight weeks, the oldest one is dropping off and the newest one is being put on. And that allows for pretty strong backup of my major databases. Evernote's on, on the Windows machine, you know, all of those kinds of things. My my Google Drive is on that machine. Although remember that Google Drive documents are not actually on your native system. So you have to use a different system in order to be able to, to do that. So I use a, a software called Drive Export. So if you go to driveexport.com, this converts all of your Google Drive documents like Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google Slides to Microsoft files. So PowerPoint, Excel, and uh, Microsoft Word files, and then saves them to, to an external source. So you can actually download all of those using the drive export tool. So that's what I do. And, and then that's saved to an external drive, which is then backed up, of course, through Duplicati, as I said, to the cloud. If you are a G Suite user, as I am for business, you can enable Google Vault, and you should also look into tools like Spin Backup or Spanning, which is a Google Apps backup tool. So it allows you to save your cloud storage stuff that's out there in a safe place. So you, you have the ability to version and to go back to backups. So that's what I do. I think that it's important to have the, the three stages, right? It's redundancy, which is giving you immediate access to that data elsewhere. And that's like Dropbox, right? You have the access well, across different uh, devices uh, through that through that use of of creating redundancy. Then some kind of short term backup, which is for, oh gosh, you know, I deleted that thing, or you know, I had some minor minor catastrophe, but I can restore from that. And then some kind of longer backup, which goes off site, preferably. So that if something catastrophic happens to everything on site, you still have at least some, it's not going to be fresh data, but it's at least most of your data that's going to be off site somewhere. And, um, and so I also do for phone and uh, phones and tablets, both Android and iOS can be backed up using a tool called SyncDroid. I'll, pay, I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. And so I back up using SyncDroid. Each of the platforms has their own backups to do so, but I actually use that um, myself because I, I like the idea of having a, a separate backup. Thank you, Francis, for uh, bringing up the topic. This has been really wonderful, and uh, and I and I appreciate that. If you have a question or a comment about this episode or something we discussed, you can go ahead and uh, comment on this episode if you go to the podcast website, productivitycast.net forward slash 051, which is the episode number 051. There at the bottom of the page, you can go ahead and leave a comment or question, and one of us will be glad to respond. 
uh, if you also are there on productivitycast.net forward slash 051, you will find the show notes and a machine produced transcript. So you can jump to particular uh, sections and you'll find all the live clickable links to the things that we discussed here. And there's also a page where you can learn how to subscribe to the podcast if you're not a subscriber already. So go ahead and check that all out. Thank you to Augusto, Francis, and Art for joining me here on this cast. Thank you, gentlemen. And if you could, if you happen to be in iTunes, uh, in the Apple Podcasts, Google Play Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to this, feel free to leave a, a rating or review. The positive feedback is just always welcome. And your reviews help us grow our personal productivity listening community. So thank you from all of us here on the Productivity Cast team for doing that. Uh, we've reached the end of this episode, but not the end of Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things personal productivity. So join us again here next week. Take care, everyone, and here's to your productive life. That's it for this Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things productivity, with your hosts, Ray Sidney Smith and Augusto Pinaud, with Francis Wade and Art Gelwicks.